The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everyone, welcome to our webinar on cybersecurity best practices for IT OT networks. My name is Scott Siphon with Moxa, and I'll be your moderator for the day. I'd also like to introduce our presenter, Rich Wood. Rich is currently the product marketing division manager here at Moxa and has over 20 years of experience in industrial automation. His work with plant engineers, system integrators, and equipment manufacturers, all in various markets, has allowed him to understand the, and address the growing list of cybersecurity concerns. Before we get started, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, Please submit, it, submit them in the questions pane, and we'll either try to address them throughout the webinar or during our live Q&A at the end of the presentation. With that said, I think we're ready. Let me send it over to Rich. All right, thanks, Scott, and thank you, everyone, for spending your time with us this morning. Uh, my name is Rich Wood, as Scott mentioned, and I'll be presenting today. So before we get started, I just wanted to do a brief introduction of Moxa. So Moxa is a manufacturer of industrial communication and networking products. We've been in business for a little over 30 years, and it's been interesting to uh, evolve with the industry from the world of serial to ethernet to cloud-based connectivity. And data is at the heart of the industrial internet of things and ITOT convergence uh, to make critical data data-driven decisions, business first need to capture and collect the data from all sorts of devices from the field before converting it into business information. Data getting from the producers at the bottom of this diagram from the actual sensors and app, you know, up to the top with the application securely and efficiently is key. And Mox's solutions are all about doing that from our edge connectivity devices that do, you know, connect legacy I.O. devices, uh, serial devices, industrial protocol conversion, or video, to our industrial computing products that can do protocol conversion and data consolidation directly to the cloud, to our network infrastructure products, uh, providing that core infrastructure to get the plant level data to the SCADA systems and IT systems that, that use that data. So here's our agenda for this morning. Uh, first, we're gonna start off with some IT OT network security trends. Then we're gonna talk about some of the, the cybersecurity standards that are prevalent today. Uh, we'll get into some of the top vulnerabilities and gaps, and then talk about some best practices and tips to get you started. So, so why uh, cybersecurity has become such an issue? Um, so there's two major trends. One is the Internet of Things, which generally is referred to as connecting devices directly to the Internet. Uh, so that and that the fact that you're exposing your end devices to the internet pres presents some security issues. And the second, which is the, the main focus of today's webinar, is ITOD convergence. You know, as those IT systems connect with the control systems, that presents a potential security issue on both sides. And so, you know, how do we address that and, uh, and meet the needs of both parties? Uh, while accomplishing the business goals. So the Department of Homeland Security says cybersecurity in the U.S. is one of the U.S.'s most important national security priorities. They've established an entire division called ICS CERT, which stands for Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team. And they're dedicated to securing industrial control systems. The organization raises awarenesses of latent problems in the industry, as well as publishes safe practices to aid those in the industry. According to data collected by ICS CERT, they see the critical manufacturing and energy sectors consistently in the top three, uh, as far as the number of incidences between 2014 and 2016. Uh, the 2017 data should be coming out soon, and. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll share that as it comes available to us. In addition, the communication sector is now in the top two. And the communication sectors represent the communication infrastructure of all businesses. 
security is definitely a concern now in the industrial control systems. So looking at the types of threats reported in the 290 incidences that were reported in 2016, we see that phishing, weak authentication, and network scanning were some of the top threat vectors. But another thing to note was that 28% was that of the incidents that were reported, there was not enough information to determine the source of the threat. And that's kind of scary. As a result of this growing threat, companies are taking industrial cybersecurity much more seriously. And we're seeing more and more collaboration between the IT departments and OT engineers to reduce their overall risk of a breach. You know, here's two studies, one by Accenture showing 50% of companies surveyed are considering merging their IT and OT departments in the next 12 months. And that was from last year, so theoretically that could be happening right now. And a similar 2017 study done by the PMMI found that 58% of companies surveyed said their IT and OT departments were already collaborating on cybersecurity. So when looking at the top business concerns for securing industrial control systems, ensuring reliability and availability remains the number one concern, followed by ensuring health and safety of employees. But the thing to note is that improving security has risen from to, into the top three from eighth place just a few years ago. In looking at the top three threat vectors, devices and things that cannot protect themselves is a top concern. This would include devices that don't have property security features, legacy devices that were never designed to be networked, or devices with known vulnerabilities that are not patchable. Another top threat vector is internal or accidental threats, such as an employee plugging a laptop into an open port on the ICS and infecting it. The threat vector that gets the most press, though, is the external hackers or even nation states that have made it into the news in these past few years. So the most important thing to understand about security is that it isn't something that you buy. It's a discipline that's developed over time. The chart shown here from ARC Advisory Group shows a typical maturity model where companies begin with some relatively low cost methods like device hardening and gaining accurate inventories on connected assets. From there, develop, deploying firewalls and DMZs as well as implementing access control are typically the next steps. Deploying zones and conduits to develop containment zones using additional firewalls and whitelisting allowed traffic rounds out the typical security initiatives. From there, getting into security information and event management software or anomaly and breach detection and other software packages are really they require a full an investment in full-time security teams in order to manage and implement these systems. So one of the biggest challenges that we hear from customers in the, is the differences in expertise and perspectives between the IT and OT teams as they begin to collaborate on cybersecurity. This chart from ICS CERT covers some of the big differences in perspectives between the two teams. Typically, these differences are revealed as the IT teams attempt to deploy enterprise security back best practices on the industrial control systems. Things that are easily identified and automated, such as patch management on the IT side, can be lengthy and laborious processes on the OT side, as patch patches are often not pushed from the device OEMs, and these patches may actually break production systems. Other examples include technology support life. Enterprise IT equipment typically has a support life of two to three years and then is upgraded or replaced, whereas OT equipment routinely sees service lives of 10 or 20 years or more. In the IT world, the systems are rather mature that automatically inventory and classify assets, whereas on the OT side, accurate asset inventories are rare 
and what off and and they often consist of manually updated spreadsheets. So let's talk about kind of the, the top three typical challenges that uh, that we see that uh, can be improved uh, on cybersecurity for industrial networks. So first, most legacy industrial network devices lack security features since the original design for the industrial equipment is for reliability and not for security protection. Secondly, the network design in many legacy industrial network topologies did never considered security protection. In many cases, uh, you know, we'll see, uh, go into a factory or a plant and see that the, the, the control network is one big flat layer two network with no segmentation at all. And thirdly, even if you select and enable the security features on the devices and the network is protected and segmented by firewalls, it's still difficult to manage security. A field technician may forget to change the password or enable uh, unsecured connections without notice. So let's dive a little deeper on uh, that first vulnerability, the lack of device security features. When we look at this first challenge, we see that there are many potential security holes which must be considered when working with legacy network equipment. There are many areas of concern around unauthorized access, insecure configuration and password protections, weak password strength, and an inability to log security events. In fact, re referring back to one of the earlier slides where 28% you know, of the 2016 uh, incidents, they didn't understand what the threat vector was. In many cases, that's because of that lack of uh, adequate logging of security events. And so without these basic security features, any of the end devices be, could be a weak point of the network. The second challenge is the lack of secure network design practices. It's common for legacy systems to connect to each other in one flat network without segmentation to limit access to resources. This results in an in in a network penetration in one area, allowing access throughout the whole network. Proper network segmentation can help to isolate a penetration to a single security zone. The third challenge is that even if the network has been secured at installation, problems can show up later down the road. On day one, the network may have been properly secured, but on day 100, during an expansion project or maintenance event, how can you be sure that it's still secure? Proper operational processes and procedures need to be in place to make sure that security happens over the long run. So the big question we get from a lot of our customers is where do I start? And that's where standards come in. Uh, so this is uh, just a, a snapshot of a handful of the most common standards that we see customers uh, referencing as they put together their security policies. Uh, so uh, NIST, uh, NIST 800, NERC SIP for the power industry, ISA 99 or IEC 62443 for industrial control systems, CIS critical security controls, and ISO 27000 series are all some of the ones that we see referenced on a regular basis. And this chart here really just shows a couple of things, is that the, the scope and intent of these uh, different standards are a little different, but that there is a high degree of overlap. In fact, this chart here, which uh, I'm I'm pretty sure you can't read the detail on this. Uh, my intent was really just to show that if you were to cross-reference uh, some of the major standards, that there's a high degree of consistency between them. Um, as far as what their objectives are, there may be some differences in, in how they recommend you implement those objectives or solutions to those objectives. But uh, the you know, really any of those standards that you choose is probably going to steer you down the road of best practices.
So for today, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with NIST 800 because typically when we engage with both the IT and OT people, the IT people are more familiar with the NIST framework. Um, and that's because the, the NIST framework really is, a, you know, it, it gives you kind of a life cycle approach, a five step, step approach, but it really defines what or outcomes that you're looking to achieve. Um, and they're in these five areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. But they also reference uh, what they call informative references, which are other documents and standards which are meant to help you determine the how and how much security is appropriate for your specific environment. And so those informative references may be different for the IT environment than they are for the OT environment. You know, so one of the, the, the first questions that most of these standards address is how much security do I need? And you know, that's a process of really assessing uh, you know, what are the assets you're trying to protect, what is the likelihood that somebody is going to try and break in, and what is the, the impact of a breach? Um, you know, and depending on what, the, what that risk level is, determining an appropriate level of security. So this curve is really just meant to demonstrate a couple of things. Uh, the first is, if you look at the red curve, um, that pretty much matches that earlier slide that showed that maturity model. That you know, typically you're starting with some fairly low cost initiatives, but those low cost initiatives, if you look, if you look at the the orange curve, those typically have the biggest impact on lowering your probability of a breach. Um, and as you add different uh, different security elements, the cost and complexity goes up, and the incremental uh, reduction in probability goes down. So typically, what people are looking for is that optimal level of security for some minimum cost. So the things we're going to talk about here are some of these things that are on the left-hand side here, where they're fairly low cost the things to deploy, but they have a, a pretty large impact on the overall level of security. So looking back at NIST 800, uh, as we mentioned before, it defines kind of the, uh, you know, the overall uh, outcomes that, that you're typically looking for. And it breaks them down into these major function categories and subcategories. And then in this chart here, what this is referencing is for an industrial control systems, here are the informative references that they, they list to help you determine how and how much security to implement. And you can see it references ISA 62443, uh, various elements, uh, which is the same as IEC 62443. So this is just meant to give you a little overview of the, the kind of the roles and scope of the 62443 standard. So you can see at the top, you've got uh, a series of standards that apply to the asset owner. And so that's really about determining, you know, how valuable is what I'm trying to protect? What is the probability of a breach? And what is that overall level of security that's appropriate for me? Then there's the, the second section down there, where it kind of points to the system, uh, applies to the system integrator. And so whoever's designing and deploying your network, here are the best practices for how to design the network or system uh, from a security standpoint. And then the, the bottom level there really is at the component level. And this is where this is really applicable to component suppliers like Moxa, where it's it, it goes as as deep as to say these are the actual features that your products should incorporate from a security standpoint to facilitate your customers designing and implementing networks that will conform to these standards. And so when we talk about security levels, the, the 62443 standard defines four different levels of security. Uh, SL1 through SL4. 
So SL1 is really, you know, these are the things you wanted to deploy to, to keep from, uh, you know, a careless em employee or a contractor from inadvertently affecting your systems. Uh, so you're really looking at, you know, they're not trying to attack the system. Typically it was inadvertent uh, and it's typically internal, uh, either an employee or somebody you've given permission to come in contact with your industrial control system. SL2 is really where we start getting into hackers, you know, um, and this is the level that we find most people are deploying at this point, uh, you know, with the exception of nuclear power plants and, uh, you, you know, substations and, uh, you know, assets that are at risk for either organized hacking or, you know, nation state level hacking. But SL2 really, you know, it's protecting you against kind of generic hacking skills. Uh, you know, people with fairly low motivation to go specifically at your organization. The means are fairly simple and the resources are typically, you know, an individual as opposed to an organized group of people trying to attack you. Uh, then SL3 gets a little more complicated if you feel like there's people that are organizing to try and attack your organization, then maybe SL3 is appropriate. You know, and if uh, the government of North Korea has their sights on you, then maybe SL4 is right for you. So let's dive a little deeper into, um, you know, starting at the bottom, 62443-4-2. Uh, so this is really, we're talking about the, if you're buying new industrial control uh, communications equipment, what types of security elements should you be looking for and implementing in your systems? So there's seven, so these are seven different functional requirement areas and, excuse me, and the system requirements of uh, the 3.3 document. The 4.2 document, it specifies how these specific requirement enhancements are called out in each of these areas based on the security level uh, compliance selected, you know, SL1 or S through SL4. So let's take a look at where, where the several risks are in the ICS architecture. So unauthorized access, uh, you know, we need to prevent access to the devices themselves. Unencrypted key or configuration data, configuration files that, they typically have sensitive data in them that can be used to, to hack the system. Um, and so you, you wanna make sure that those, uh, those files are encrypted and not left in plain test, text. Um, that goes for when they're being stored or backed up, as well as when they're being transmitted. Uh, if somebody's sniffing your network connection, they could easily intercept that data, and if it's sent in plain text, they could use that to hack the system. Incomplete event logs. Uh, so how do I know if somebody is trying to get into the system? How do I know where they tried to get into the system? Uh, going back to the 28% of people that didn't have enough information to understand where their, their attack came from, uh, again, this is really a function of incomplete event logs. Uh, in com in improper configuration and lack of monitoring, uh, you know, how, how to make it less prone to error when setting up devices initially, and how to make sure that once those devices are set up properly that uh, that it maintains that way. So jumping into a, you know, a little deeper. Uh, so the main risk here, you know, password. If you log into your bank, uh, you know, and you try to log in three or four times, it typically will lock you out of the system after so many uh, attempts. They'll also keep you from al allowing you to use a simple password like password or ABC123. Uh, so just basically setting up the, the policies around, uh, you know, keeping people from gaining unauthorized access to the, the devices is really the objective here. 
as I mentioned earlier, you know, connection sniffing. So it's pretty common for some of the older serial devices, even though you have to log in to, to make changes to them, uh, that information is sent in plain text over over the, the network connections. And if you've got somebody that's sniffing those connections, uh, they can use that data to exploit your system. So by simply you know securing it with uh, encryption ciphers, uh, that even if they do sniff the connection, they don't gain gain access to your passwords and user IDs. Uh, same thing for you know encryption or excuse me uh, configuration files. Uh, I think uh, just a couple of days ago in the news there was there was a, an update on the the Russian hacking of U.S. substations. Uh, the, the power grid. Uh, so the, this was an organized group of people. They gained access to several of the uh, areas in the power grid in the U.S. and got to a point where they could actually flip switches. Uh, and when they looked at how these people gained access, they gained access by targeting companies that were working with the electric companies and found configuration files in plain text on some of their uh, hard drives, and then use that to access the system. So it, this is pretty common where you know, you're know you providing this information to a contractor, they've got it on their laptop, they leave, they completely forget about your organization when they're done with the job and don't necessarily treat your confidential data as sensitive. And so by making sure that those files are encrypted, even if somebody gains access to it, they can't easily get at the useful information. And so finally, auditing security events. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you, you know, if you don't, if you have a breach and you don't know where it came from, it makes it very hard for you to go back and and fix that hole in your system. Uh, even if somebody is unsuccessful at gaining access to your system, if you don't know they're trying, the only way you're going to find out is once they're successful. And so, making sure that you're logging security-related network events, uh, you know, storing them on uh, either a trap or syslog server, uh, you know, somewhere where you can do an audit uh, later on in the process. So jumping back to the standard, now that we've discussed some of the device-level concerns, uh, let's look at the, the next part of this, the, the system level. So central to all cybersecurity standards is the need for a security life cycle and process. Uh, this is a continual assessment of threats and, and system design. But cybersecurity also involves the segmentation of network architecture into logical zones of devices with similar security requirements. Communication between zones must be over a network link, which was referred to as a conduit. The interfaces of the conduit are typically terminated by a firewall device, which defines the zone-to-zone -zone interaction. Only specific traffic is allowed to flow across these boundaries. Applications which use these conduits must be examined and their network requirements identified so that they can operate in the secure environment. Interactions between different zones is limited so that levels two and one can communicate directly, but three cannot directly access one. And no access level from four uh, to level three or below. These need to control these interactions between zones and limit which protocols can be used over the conduits. This brings the need for an industrial firewall. A dedicated firewall is the most common method of restricting access from zone to zone, as well as providing upper layer protection through deep packet inspection. You can see here that there are different types of firewall devices available from MOXA. These are the EDR series. The performance and features vary based on different models. There's also a need to provide secure remote access to industrial control systems. This drives the need for VPN capabilities to provide encryption to the communications which travel over public networks or even private cellular networks. 
there are different technologies used depending on the application. You, know, you can also see that the number of VPN connections vary based on the device selected as well. So you may only need a lower performance device at a remote site, but need a much higher performing device at the headquarters site to support all the remote site connections. So let's look at a little bit, a, a couple of things about industrial firewalls. And one of the questions I get pretty frequently is what's the difference between an enterprise firewall and an industrial firewall? Uh, so aside from the physical differences, as far as, uh, you know, one being designed to, to operate in a nice air conditioned uh, server room versus another that's designed to operate out in the harsh environments of the factory floor, the types of traffic that they're filtering are often very different. And the skill level of the people using these devices also varies. Uh, whereas IT people are typically have somebody that understands the complexities of, of developing uh, fairly complex firewall rules. Uh, on the OT side, you know, people understand the, the control traffic that they're, they're used to uh, using, but they may not know the specific TCP or UDP ports associated with those. So in an industrial firewall, typically we try to make it a little easier for people to implement by, you know, having these quick automation profiles built in so that if I'm running Ethernet IP over, over a specific segment and I know I need that type of traffic to be whitelisted, I can just go into the, the drop down here and act, activate Ethernet IP as the, uh, the type of traffic that's allowed. So the second is, you know, we, we talked about devices that are not protectable uh, on their own. Well, there's also some protocols that, you know, were designed long before cybersecurity was even an, uh, an issue. And uh, Modbus is a good example. I think Modbus originally, I think somewhere around 1970, uh, you know, before the internet was the thing. Um, you know, so they don't have the typical uh, design for security. And that means you need to dive into the application layer data within the packets in order to find out if there's malicious code in there. A good example would be uh, Modbus, give, you know, giving a, uh, you know, a SCADA system or an HMI monitor access to a production line uh, will give it both read and write access without deep packet inspection. And often that can lead to, to trouble. Another technology that, that we're seeing more and more being used at the edge uh, is access control lists. So. Simply, simple filtering of criteria for ingress and egress traffic, such as, you know, on a particular port, you know, I want to allow traffic from certain IP addresses. Uh, I want to allow traffic to certain IP addresses or MAC addresses. I want to allow certain IP protocols, or I want to allow, uh, you know, certain Ethernet types. So. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of this, and uh, in many cases, uh, we've heard this referred to as kind of the, the poor man's firewall. So that brings us to a, a, little, a little case study. Uh, so this was a uh, steel mill in Germany, um, and they actually had a fire on one of their production lines because they had an HMI that was set up uh, through Modbus to monitor several production lines. And the operator inadvertently turned off one of the cooling fans on one of the production lines, and that caused the steel mill to catch fire. Uh, so after the fact, you know, they were looking for a way to keep this from happening again. And by simply in deploying some industrial firewalls and using deep packet inspection to only allow read access to those uh, that those production lines, uh, they, they eliminate the, the possibility of that happening again. So the final area we're going to dive into a little bit is the security management system uh, within the 62443 framework.
So one of the tools that we see as, as kind of uh, foundational on the industrial control side is a good industrial network management uh, package. This checks a lot of devices. Um, you know, in, in this case, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of people, you know, they'll get a spreadsheet from their integrator or uh, the machined OEM that gives them the devices on the network. And that may or may not be updated over time as upgrades are done or maintenance is done. Uh, so we find that this, this the, the fact that these programs can automatically scan the network and identify all of the devices, uh, potentially even some devices that aren't supposed to be connected uh, is a great first step. Um, they also uh, often allow you some fast, easy way to uh, deploy and verify security policy has been enforced in the devices. They give you visualized network topology and device status, real-time alerts and events logging, um, and they can and they'll, they'll help you provide that baseline network configuration so that should you have a problem, uh, you have a, a, at least a, a snapshot of what the, the network was supposed to look like. Uh, as well as the ability to schedule backups uh, should you have a problem. Uh, they often also include troubleshooting tools to aid, aid in network recovery, uh, and many of them also provide northbound APIs uh, to connect and share information with the IT systems, such as, you know, IT may have their own network management system or security information uh, and management system. So here's uh, kind of a snapshot of uh, Mox's MX view. Uh, this is a new security view that, that, that was released last year. Uh, you can see color coding here. Uh, we have defined a couple of security policies, high, medium, basic, and open. Uh, so high in this case is 62443 level two, medium is 62443 level one. Basic would be, uh, you know, what, uh, I believe it's what Cisco defines as kind of basic level security uh, on network devices and open means either we don't know or the device has not been configured. This little chart here gives you an idea of what, what are the elements that are addressed in each of those levels and the color coding tells you how each device has been configured currently. This is coupled with Security Wizard that allows you to quickly step through and say one of these devices is at the, the medium level and you want to bring it to high. Uh, you can run that Security Wizard. It'll show you exactly the steps you need to take to get that up to the, the policy you've defined. And as I mentioned, ongoing security management throughout the entire network lifestyle is, is, is critical. Uh, even if your IT department comes in or, or an integrator comes in and does a great job of getting you up to current standard, you know, if, if you're not monitoring to make sure that you're maintaining that level of, of security and you're not monitoring for intrusions uh, and other security events, uh, it's going to make it really difficult to ensure ongoing security. So with that, I'll just do a quick recap. Um, you know, the three main things that we're, we're recommending as the, your starting point for uh, cybersecurity. First is, you know, reinforce the, the security on the devices that you have, or if you're looking to acquire new devices, you know, here's some things to look for as you're shopping. Uh, make sure that, you know, pick, pick a standard, you know, pick the, um, the level of security that's appropriate for you, and then make sure the, 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 the components you're buying uh, can have the features to support those policies. Second is that network design, uh, secure zones and conduits, segmenting that network so that if somebody breaches one part of the network, you minimize their access to the rest of the network. And third, you know, using a visualization tool to, uh, to deploy those security policies and monitor them over time. So with that, that's the, uh, the end of uh, my presentation here. I'd like to open things up for uh, the Q&A session. 
Yeah, thanks, Rich. Um, and, and we actually got a, a lot of good questions, so thanks for those that submitted those. Uh, we have a few minutes left to address some of these questions, so we'll, we'll dive into those and get through as many as possible. Okay, so Rich, uh, the first question, is there a product certification I can look for to know that the devices I am buying have the same features I need? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so there, there are a few certifications that are starting to show up, like ISA Secure, uh, that will certify products to the IEC 62443 standards. Uh, another one is Cybersecurity Assurance from UL. But right now, adoption is really low. And the last time I checked, there were really uh, no industrial switch or router companies with certified products. Uh, Boxa is investigating third-party certification, but we have not decided on a lab or a certification at this point, and I, and I think that's probably true for most of the, the major manufacturers. Great. Thank you, Rich. Um, so next question. You mentioned IEC 62443 compliant products. What about NERC SIP compliance? Okay, so we must have somebody from the power substation market. Um, so yeah, NERC, NERC SIP is actually uh, law here in uh, the United States for, uh, that's from the North American uh, Electric Re Regulatory Commission, I believe is the name. And uh, so for products, uh, for, for MOXA's products, we have uh, a series of products specific to power substation or related to power substation applications. And for those, we do supply NERC SIP compliance tables. And I think that's pretty standard in the industry. Uh, if you're selling products to support networks within substations that, uh, you know, we, we understand that that's, you're obligated to, to conform to those standards and we do what we can to, to help you comply. Great. Okay, so next question. What about intrusion detection and prevention systems? Are they worth looking at? Uh, sure. Yeah, if you've already done a lot of the fundamentals that we've talked about today, uh, then that might be a likely next step for your organization. Uh, but as I mentioned in the earlier slides, uh, you know, cybersecurity is an ongoing process of building capabilities. So if you haven't done uh, the blocking and tackling, the basic things that we've talked about today, then, um, you know, you might be premature for you. Uh, but MOXA is in the process of evaluating developing partnerships with uh, intrusion detection systems and intrusion protection system vendors. Okay, thank you. So next question we have uh, is how can I find out if the devices I'm using have any vulnerabilities? That's a great question. Um, so I think the best place is to check with the manufacturers. They would have the most updated information about their products. But I think a great source for ongoing monitoring is the ICS CERT website. They list known vulnerabilities and they work directly with manufacturers like Moxa to communicate patches to these vulnerabilities. And you can actually sign up for alerts on their website. If you know what manufacturer's products you're using, you can sign up for alerts related to those manufacturers. And any time a vulnerability is found, they'll send you an email and, and you can look into what the, uh, what the patch available is. Okay, looking at the time, looks like we have time for one more question. So the last question we'll address, um, you showed a snapshot of a table that referenced IEC 62443 standards mapped to the NIST 800 framework. Can you share that or tell me where to get it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I got it from uh, NIST. Uh, I believe I got it from their website. Uh, might have been buried a little bit. I, I knew exactly what I was looking for, but um, if you can't find it there, feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll send you what I have. Uh, so my email address is richard.wood at moxa.com and uh, I'd be happy to share what I have with you. Okay, thank you, Rich. Thanks for your time today. Unfortunately, that's actually all the time we have for questions, so we're going to have to wrap things up. If we missed your question or if you want guidance on a specific issue or situation, please feel free to reach out to us directly at usa.moxa.com. One last note, you'll see a survey pop up after this broadcast. 
If you could please take just a few more minutes to complete the survey as we're always looking for ways to improve future webinars. Thanks again to everyone for joining us. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your day.